thank you to, to all of you. Thanks uh, to those of you who are online and thanks to the organizers for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. It's my first conference actually since January last year. Uh, so it's a, it's a great pleasure and, and honor to be here. Uh, and actually it is, I would like to say that is the, the time that I'm speaking at the latest, although it is not true. A couple of months ago, I spoke to some Uruguayan MPs at 11 uh, 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 p.m. Uh, European time, uh, but I, will, I won't take uh, much of your time. I'll be, I'll be as brief as possible. I'll talk for around 20 minutes and then we can have a brief discussion or otherwise we can continue the discussion uh, over a, a glass of beer. I have seen some of you already took that decision, which seems very wise to me. Why, why should you care about Latin America? Why should a bunch of mostly Germans, a few Austrians, I know there are also people from other countries, why should you care about what is going on in Latin America? Well, I, I would say very briefly for three reasons. First of all, because there are many migration links between Germany and Latin America. That's the good thing about talking about Latin America anywhere in the world. I can present it in Japan or in Lebanon or in Russia and explain to my audience how you know thousands of migrants from their own countries emigrated to Latin America in the past because between 1880 and 1930 uh, South America in particular and mo most notably uh, Argentina was the second largest destination of migrants in the world after the US actually Argentina received more migrants per person than the US in that 50 years period which of course coincides with the great period of European emigration we also have even uh, going back to the discussion by Nadine about uh, colonialism, we have the creation of cities in Venezuela by German emigrants in the 16th century. For example, the city of Maracaibo, which was founded as New Nuremberg. And it, there is a, a long history behind that, which involves the Habsburgs and uh, Charles I of Spain, fifth of Germany. Uh, and of course, we have had more recent emigration of Germans throughout the 20th century, particularly to Brazil and Argentina. Uh, but I have to say that Venezuela was the last country in Latin America to receive an important uh, number of European migrants, mostly from Portugal, Spain, and Italy in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And that has a, a very important role uh, today, as I will explain in a second. So there are a number of reasons why you as mostly you as Germans should, should care about Venezuela or about Latin American immigration law, but mostly of course, because we are facing a, a dramatic situation where we have um, more than uh, 5 million Venezuelans that have left the country in the last uh, five, six years. And this is the second largest displacement possibly in the war right now after that of Syrians. Of course, we uh, don't have perhaps the whole data about uh, Afghanistan, right? Uh, but this is a very large displacement. And um, one interesting characteristics of this displacement, displacement as it happens in many situations in the global south is that Venezuelans are going not to Europe, and that is why we talk very little about Venezuelans in Europe. They are going to other Latin American countries, neighboring countries, mostly in South America, but also in Central America, also in Mexico, and also in the Caribbean. Actually, in Europe, uh, the, numbers are, the numbers are very low. I don't know if you have any data for Germany. I didn't have the time to, to look for it. But in Spain, where we have the largest Venezuelan population, we are talking about 158,000 Venezuelans uh, in Spain. That is not a very big number at all because we have more or less 6 million foreigners between EU and non-EU citizens in Spain. And those numbers can be perhaps uh, a little bit reduced in the sense that many Venezuelans who live in Spain actually have Portuguese, Italian, and Spanish uh, citizenship because of those very recent emigration flows uh, that went to Venezuela in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, or they are family members of those, right? And therefore, they do not count in the statistics as Venezuelans. They count as EU nationals or family members of EU nationals. In any case, the numbers are very low when you compare them with the numbers of Venezuelans going to other South American countries. And actually here you have the total of Venezuelans abroad. So more than 5.6 million Venezuelans are abroad. The numbers uh, or the data from the UN in 2015 talk about 600,000 Venezuelans abroad. So as you can see, since 2015, we have more than 5 million Venezuelans that have left the country. In Latin America and the Caribbean, most of them, more than 4.6 million. We have that uh, close more than two and a half million have actually residence permits. Another important number have 
refugee status. There are many refugee applications pending, particularly in Peru, and we can talk more about that later. And, and still, there is a large number of Venezuelans who are in an irregular situation. Around 2 million Venezuelans are in an irregular situation. So what I would like to do with you briefly uh, today is to explain you how Latin American, uh, Caribbean, and uh, Central, well, Latin American and Caribbean, but mostly when I'm talking about Caribbean, I'm going to talk about Dominican Republic, how they are reacting to the arrival of this large number of Venezuelans, a very sudden uh, arrival uh, in a very short period, and actually in some cases to countries which either, even if historically they receive uh, immigration, as I just mentioned in the 19th and 20th century, recently they had very few migrants. So for example, in the case of Colombia, where we have more than 1.7 million Venezuelans, uh, we are talking about a country that around 2015 had less than 100,000 foreigners in Colombia, right? So now we have close to 2 million uh, foreigners. So very large numbers arriving in a very short period. Uh, and here you have the main destinations, as I said. So first of all, uh, Colombia, then we have Peru, more than a million uh, Venezuelans. Uh, Peru is also similar to Colombia in the sense that there were very few uh, migrants uh, arriving to Peru uh, in the second half of the 20th century or in the early part of the 21st century. Then we have Chile and Ecuador with close to half a million each. We then have Brazil and Argentina. And then as you can see, we start, we start having countries in Central America. So the first six countries are in South America, right? And then we start having uh, Panama and Dominican Republic in the Caribbean, Mexico and Costa Rica, okay? So most Venezuelans are going to other countries in South America. So how are countries receiving Venezuelans? What is the legal status that Venezuelans are obtaining in the different countries. I will show you four categories of how uh, Venezuelans are being treated from a legal point of view. And then I will conclude with the Colombian example um, and the new institute that has been created in Colombia, which I think is extremely interested, interesting um, from a global uh, point of view at a comparative level. I have never seen anything like that uh, globally. So I think it's a very interesting example that we can discuss a little bit more in depth. So first of all, are Venezuelans refugees? Could a Venezuelan be considered as a refugee? Well, of course, if any Venezuelans fall under the Geneva um, Convention definition of who is a refugee, a Venezuelan could be considered as a refugee. But in the case of Latin America, we also have the Cartagena Declaration. The Cartagena Declaration is a non-binding, a non-legally binding declaration from 1984, which says that refugees are not only those uh, enshrined in the Geneva Convention, but also those who fall under any of these five categories that you have here on the slide, right? People who have fled their country because uh, their life, security, or freedom have been threatened by generalized violence, that is the first option, or due to a foreign aggression, second option, or due to internal conflicts, third option, or due to a massive violation of human rights, fourth option, or the fifth option due to other circumstances which have seriously disturbed the public order. And there is a, a, an agreement uh, in saying that in Venezuela, we certainly have a, a generalized um, a dist disturb, um, um, uh, disturb uh, public order. Uh, we could possibly claim that we have violations of human rights and we could, we could also possibly claim that we have a, a generalized uh, violence in the country. Um, so at least three out of those five could fit, uh, could define uh, what is going on in Venezuela. Uh, I have to say that 15 countries in Latin America have internalized this uh, expanded definition of who is a refugee in their refugee laws. So this is not any longer a non-binding declaration. It is actually part of the refugee laws of 15 countries in Latin America. Uh, so are Venezuelans being treated as refugees according to this expanded definition of who is a refugee under the Cartagena Declaration? Well, the answer is by and large, no. The only exception to that is Brazil. Brazil has granted uh, to around 50,000 Venezuelans refugee status in uh, Brazil, according to the 
uh, expanded definition of who is a refugee uh, under uh, Cartagena. And then we have a few examples of that also happening in Mexico, very few in Bolivia and very few in Paraguay. So by and large, even though in every single country to which Venezuelans are moving, uh, which have adopted this expanded definition, even though in theory, they could be considered as refugees, countries are not granting refugee status to Venezuelans. Actually, in some countries, for example, Argentina, they use the expanded definition of Cartagena in other cases. They have used it for uh, different nationalities coming uh, from around the globe, but not for Venezuelans, okay? Uh, there is also, uh, there is why, why then Brazil has uh, accepted to give refugee status to Venezuelans. I think that is related to the particular uh, political position of Bolsonaro. I don't know if you know much about Bolsonaro. Possibly you have heard uh, about his political views, not only generally, but also on migration. Uh, he renounced, for example, the global compact on migration that uh, Brazil had initially endorsed. Uh, but nonetheless, he has a very uh, confrontational uh, political position against the government of Venezuela. And that is one of the reasons behind the granting of refugee status to uh, Venezuelan uh, nationals in Brazil, even though uh, by and large Brazil is not using the expanded Cartagena definition for other nationalities that could perhaps deserve as well to be offered refugee status in Brazil, right? Um, so first option, are they refugees? Well, in some cases they are being uh, granted refugee status, but by and large they are not being granted refugee status. Second option, are Venezuelans regional citizens? And perhaps here I have to explain that in the case of South America, we also have free movement of people. Uh, there is this agreement called the Mercosur Residence Agreement, which applies in nine out of the 12 countries in South America, has been ratified by all countries in South America, except for Venezuela itself, Suriname and Guyana. What this agreement does, you know, explain very briefly, is that if you are a national from one of these nine countries that has ratified the agreement, you have the right to reside, the right to war, the right to equal treatment with nationals in the other eight member states, okay? Venezuela is a, a full member of Mercosur since 2012, but was suspended in its membership in 2017. Venezuela had the obligation to ratify this Mercosur residence agreement, but never did it, okay? So are nonetheless Venezuelans being treated as regional citizens in other countries? Well, the answer is yes, in some countries. So for example, in Argentina and in Uruguay, Venezuelans have the right to obtain a residence permit, not because they are fleeing a particular situation in Venezuela, but simply because they are South American nationals. They have Venezuelan nationality, and therefore they have the right to obtain residence in both Argentina and in Uruguay. And actually they are obtaining residence in both countries. If you look at the statistics, there are almost no Venezuelans in an irregular situation in Argentina or in Uruguay, simply because they can arrive and they can obtain a residence permit as regional migrants, as regional citizens, if you like. Uh, that is because of a unilateral uh, expansion of the Mercosur residence agreement that both Argentina and Uruguay are doing towards Venezuelans because Argentinians or Uruguayans do not have the same right in Venezuela because as I said, Venezuela never ratified this Mercosur residence agreement. In the case of Brazil, it's quite interesting. I just told you that 50,000 Venezuelans in Brazil have refugee status. Nonetheless, uh, Brazil has also adopted a decree by which Venezuelans can also apply for a residence permit as regional migrants. So this is also a unilateral extension of the Mercosur residence agreement. However, if you obtain a residence permit under this unilateral extension, you cannot apply any longer for refugee status in Brazil. Okay, so it's one or the other. That is one of the criticisms of Brazil. And then in the case of Ecuador, it's quite interesting because in 2017, Ecuador actually enshrined in its uh, migration law um, a chapter, a full chapter, actually I was quite involved in that process, a full chapter on South American citizenship. And that uh, with uh, six articles saying that if you were a South American national, you also had the right to reside, etc., cetera, in, in Ecuador, right of entry, right to work, equal treatment. That full chapter was abolished, uh, derogated in a reform in 2020. Nonetheless, there is a still a bilateral agreement between Ecuador and Venezuela from 2010, which means that Venezuelans falling under that bilateral agreement can also obtain a residence permit in Ecuador, the same as Ecuadorians actually can obtain a residence permit in Venezuela. 
Venezuela. Before uh, 2015, it was actually Ecuadorians moving to Venezuela, not the other way around. There were almost no Venezuelans in Ecuador before 2015. So third possibility are Venezuelans, vulnerable migrants who are worthy of being granted some sort of humanitarian residence status, right? And that is the third option that many countries have been using in Latin America and the Caribbean. You have here some examples from Costa Rica, from Chile, from Peru, from Colombia, from Paraguay. And so these countries, what they have been doing is they have been uh, um, creating these temporary residence permits uh, to which uh, Venezuelan migrants could apply until a particular date. And then they will obtain a one or two years residence permit, which in some cases will be renewable, right? There are a number of problems with this approach. Well, first of all, is that obviously when you have a deadline to apply for a particular permit, a number of people are going to uh, fall outside of the uh, temporal scope and they're not going to be able to apply and therefore to obtain uh, a residence permit. And these residence permits, as I mentioned, they're also temporary. So in some cases, there are problems with the renewal of the residence permits. The idea behind being, uh, them being temporary was that initially some countries in the region were thinking, well, you know, this is a situation that will eventually solve itself. Uh, Venezuelans have never emigrated in their history. Venezuela was always a country of immigration. Um, so unlike my own country, Spain, your own country, Germany, Venezuela never emigrated in history, never, never. It was always an immigration country, right? So uh, these governments were thinking, well, eventually, you know, if the situation improves in Venezuela, since Venezuelans are not used to emigrate, they will come back to Venezuela. Of course, the situation has been more complex than that. And that has led with many problems with the separate residence permits because uh, many Venezuelans have not been able to obtain them and therefore they have fall into irregularity. They, have, um, they are irregular migrants residing in different countries in Latin America, right? And there is also a lot of discretion involved in the, some of these temporary residence permits, a lot of bureaucracy involved, but nonetheless, they have granted residence status also to thousands of Venezuelans around the region. And the fourth possibility is, uh, could be are Venezuelans therefore irregular migrants? If they don't obtain refugee status or a residence permit as regional citizens or a humanitarian residence permit, are they irregular migrants? And as I mentioned in the beginning, there are around 2 million uh, Venezuelans who are actually undocumented. They don't have a particular residence permit in the country where they reside. But I have to say something that I think is very important also in a European context, which is that the response to that irregularity has not been expulsion. Uh, there are, of course, some cases of expulsion uh, with a lot of media from far, for example, in Chile. Uh, there is, of course, an increase in xenophobic discourse in some countries or among certain politicians. But the main response to the irregularity of Venezuelan migrants has been the principle of non-criminalization of irregular migration and actually regularization, which of course is also, uh, something that is very common also in Europe. We have had uh, numerous regularization procedures, either extraordinary or as you have here in Germany, permanent mechanisms of regularization through which thousands of migrants each year will obtain a residence permit. We also have those in France, in Spain. We have seen recent examples of extraordinary regularizations in Portugal, in Italy. Of course, that is not part of the European Commission discourse, right? In at least since 2014, we have a, uh, an obsession with return and with uh, expulsion. The word regularization has disappeared the vocabulary of the European Commission. That is not the case in Latin America. In Latin America, we have numerous regularization procedures taking place every single year, either permanent or extraordinary regularization procedures. So that is why you see here uh, regularizations happen in Argentina, in Bolivia, Chile, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, Peru, even in countries where you have possibilities to obtain a residence permit. For example, here you have Ecuador, right? Why do we have a regularization procedure in Ecuador? Well, because as I mentioned, some Venezuelans were not able to fit under the requirements under the previous immigration law or under the bilateral agreement, and they were nonetheless irregular, and that is why you still have these regularizations happening. One that I think is quite important is Dominican Republic. I wouldn't like to put Dominican Republic as an example of anything because it is not when it comes to migration, nationality, 
uh, and we can discuss more about that later because it has to do more with Dominicans of Haitian origin rather than with Venezuelans. But for example, in the case of Dominican Republic, 114,000 Venezuelans in the country, only 7,000 with a residence permit. So the response has been to launch this regularization procedure in 2021. And I have to insist on that. Many of these procedures have happened during the COVID period in 2020 and 2021. So let me um, move now and also to conclude uh, with the Colombian example. Why I think the Colombian example is so uh, interesting, uh, not only from a Latin American point of view, but I would say globally. Uh, well, it's a very interesting example because as I mentioned, it's, it's the country that has received by far the largest number of Venezuelan nationals, 1.7 million to which we need to add actually many returnees uh, who had Colombian nationality and who had resided in Venezuela in some cases for decades, because I insist Venezuela was the migration destination um, in the region, not only for Colombians, but also for others, Equatorians, Peruvians, during the military dictatorships, also for Argentinians, Chileans, etc. right? Um, and there were thousands and thousands and thousands of Colombians in Venezuela. So between the Venezuelan nationals and returnees, we are talking about more than 2 million people that Colombia have received in a period of five or six years. It's not a small number for a country of around 45 million people, right? Um, and initially what Colombia started doing was to adopt many of these temporary residence permits that I have just explained also for other countries. And the problem again with many of these residence permits, Venezuela, Colombia adopted uh, no less than 12 of these different uh, temporary residence permits, uh, including uh, some procedures to renew uh, permits that had been granted initially. The problem was, of course, that by 2020, um, when Venezuela, uh, when Colombia produced uh, an important uh, report, which in which it was also, uh, you know, grabbing the attention of international donors, um, the statistics were saying that out of the 1.7 million Venezuelans in Colombia, um, close or around 900,000 of them were in an irregular situation, despite all these temporary residence permits, right? And the reasons for that, I insist, is that you have deadlines, sometimes you cannot fulfill the conditions, sometimes you have entered irregularly into the country and that disqualifies you from obtaining a temporary residence permit, etc. So what Colombia did was quite uh, interesting in my view, uh, was to create, what you see here, a uh, label as a temporary institute of protection for Venezuelans. But this is not temporary in the sense that it is a 10 years residence permit, which is quite unique, I would say. If you think, for example, at the, uh, about the temporary protection status in the US, it's usually for a couple of years, then uh, the government renews it for particular nationalities. Right here, we're talking about a 10 years residence permit. That is one of the reasons why I think it's quite unique. And the second reason why I think it's quite unique is that it doesn't have a particular deadline after which you cannot apply. So Venezuelans who were already in Colombia until the 31st of January, 2021, they can apply for it, regardless of whether they were of whether they were in an irregular situation or not. So at the same time, this is a very large process of regularization of Venezuelans. But also those Venezuelans who enter into Colombia until May 2023, and they enter regularly with a passport through a border control, they can also apply for these 10 years residence permit. And this is also very, very unique because usually when you have these types of permits, you have a deadline, like for example, 31st of January, 2021, and nobody else who's coming afterwards can apply for it. Colombia, the Colombian government realized that that was not going to be the case, that still there will be a number of Venezuelans coming into the country and therefore decided to put a deadline in the future. So in May, 2023, and I think that is extremely interesting as well. This is a complementary mechanism to refugee protection. So as in the case of Brazil, if you obtain this one, you have to renounce to a refugee status or to your application for refugee status. And that has been certainly uh, criticized. And um, other elements that have been criticized is that this is not a path towards citizenship. In theory, if you have a certain migration category in Colombia as a Venezuelan, you could apply for citizenship after one year of residence. This is not one of those, okay? So this is not a path towards uh, citizenship. 
And a third criticism of um, this uh, procedure is that there is no subjective right to obtain it. Even if you fulfill the conditions, in theory, the administration could deny your application, right? And there are a number of reasons already uh, under which uh, the residence permit is not available. And you have those in the slide. Um, I won't go through, through them, but perhaps the last one is the, the one that could be prone to more criticism, uh, because if you have applied for a refugee status in another country and that has been denied, in theory, you cannot apply for this residence permit, which in my view is not, uh, it, it doesn't fall uh, one from, it doesn't follow one from the other, right? Um, what is the procedure for, for this? Uh, so first, um, the Colombian government has established a, a registry of Venezuelan migrants. So far, more than 1.4 million uh, Venezuelan nationals have registered. So this is the first step. This is a conditio uh, sine qua non. Unless you register, you cannot then apply for the residence permit. And then the second phase, which has started in uh, last month, actually, in October 2021, with a, a lot of media attention, is uh, actually the first Venezuelan nationals obtaining this 10 years residence permit that will allow them to reside in Colombia until 2031. And in that period, if they fulfill the conditions to move into a different migration category under the migration law, they can do so and they can move into a different uh, migration permit. Okay, this one will expire in 2031, okay? Um, so what is, the, what is the future just to conclude? Because I know where there is quarter past nine. <laughs> uh, what is the future? Well, um, we don't know what will happen in terms of migration flow. Certainly the closure of borders uh, have led to a decrease in the number of uh, Venezuelans uh, live in the country. And um, of course, uh, many of those who um, had the social and financial capital to do so, or the possibilities due to many different reasons, family reasons, et cetera, have already left the country before uh, COVID. Um, so the estimates that we had in the last uh, couple of years that we're talking about more than 6 million Venezuelans outside of the country, we need to take those with a pinch of salt, right? And as I mentioned, of course, um, we have uh, COVID, obviously, which has hit uh, the economies of many Latin American countries uh, quite badly. Uh, we are talking about, uh, in many cases, countries with large informal uh, labor markets that has affected not only Venezuelan migrants, that has also affected nationals in different countries. But nonetheless, I would like to insist on that. Uh, the measures that have been adopted in 2020 and in 2021 in Colombia, in Peru, in Costa Rica, in Dominican Republic, in Ecuador, et cetera, by and large have been moving still in that direction of regularization, granting residence permits as the first answer to the arrival of Venezuelans or to the residents of those Venezuelans who were already living in those countries. And that has not been influenced by and large by the changes in government uh, in different uh, countries. Uh, actually, you have measures uh, which have been uh, quite uh, progressive when it comes to Venezuelan migrants uh, adopted by center right governments, which in other aspects of migration or uh, refugee law have not been as progressive. And of course, that has to do with the particular configuration of politics uh, in uh, Latin America. And uh, the, if you like, the political position of the Maduro government in Venezuela. And something that has been very important also in my view, um, and since we have also many lawyers here, um, I think is uh, very notable, the increase of actors involved in migration law and refugee law in the region, lawyers, of course, courts, uh, but also civil society, academia, uh, law clinics in various universities, migration centers emerging in various universities across the region, and uh, in countries which I insist didn't have this kind of actors uh, so um, involved because the numbers were very limited when it came to migrants. These were countries that were much more interested in discussing immigration and the rights of their nationals abroad rather than immigration. Well, that has changed also with the arrival of Venezuelans. So thank you very much, and we'll leave it there. <laughs> okay, wonderful, thank you so much, uh, Diego, for an excellent uh, speech.
um, which I'm sure um, will have sparked many questions. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it has. I think Crystal in the back and Anna in the front. Thank you very much for this uh, very insightful uh, presentation of the situation of Venezuelans in South America. I think it's very rare that we get this kind, this level of uh, detailed insight into, in the, into the situation in other continents here uh, in Germany. I have two questions. One is a critical question. You portrayed the mechanism, the Colombian mechanism for reception of Venezuelans in Colombia in rather, I would say, positive terms. Is it really such a good thing when uh, one might argue that virtually all Venezuelans who arrive in Colombia should be entitled or could be entitled to some form of refugee protection in terms of the Cartagena definition? And is it really a good thing to trade uh, subjective rights under refugee protection for something that is devoid of such uh, subjective rights? I have my doubts. Uh, my second question is more a question of uh, understanding. You mentioned that uh, in Colombia, at least for Venezuelans who arrived in the country until the uh, beginning of the year, uh, the Colombian government doesn't insist on them having a valid passport in order to grant them residence rights. I would be interested to know um, to know how the situation is in other countries in the region because it's so incredibly difficult for a Venezuelan nationals to renew their passports is there anything we in europe and especially in germany could learn from these countries when it comes to granting residence rights to people who don't have a passport yeah. thank you. okay do you mind if we collect no next? but can i have a pen then yes please. of course sorry <laughs> and and the paper oh that would be great thank you uh, yes thank you also for, for my side for that really interesting um presentation. My question would be in how far, so what we see in Europe frequently is, and I think it's perhaps something one might see elsewhere as well, is that the arrival of a large number of refugees or uh, let's say a recent refugee, so to say political crisis, that this has also consequences for the general attitude towards migration and also towards free movement in, in a region, if there had been free movement before. Mm -hmm. So my question would be, I mean, given my existing but limited knowledge about the about immigration situations in Latin America, that is an exceptional situation with Venezuela at the moment. And my question would be in how far you could observe such impact on the general attitude towards migration in general, also including labor migration, of course. Do we have one more that we could add to the list to the first round? Uli. I actually would be very interested. Thank you very much for uh, your presentation. I would be very interested uh, whether you have seen some European sort of initiatives to keep <laughs> the Venezuelan in, uh, in Latin America. I uh, mean, not talking about a large number, but although we're talking about some 150,000, you told me, um, uh, in Spain, which uh, if you compare with African sort of, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> African as a continent, mm -hmm. sort of uh, refugees, uh, we, we can compare this kind of numbers. Uh, and the initiatives that European is taking in Africa, uh, especially to ECOWAS areas or similar, uh, is quite, it's quite striking to see. I was interested whether you see similar kind of initiatives maybe from Spain in uh, Latin America. Thank you. Great. So let's maybe give you an opportunity to answer and then see whether we have time for maybe a, a second round of questions. No, uh, thank you. Um, can I remove yes. it? Oh, thank you very much. Um, no, that's that's great. I'll, I'll start with the last question. Uh, not Europe so much, but the US. Uh, so let's say the US was very happy about the Colombian um, temporary 10 years uh, residence uh, permit. And I can only say that anecdotally from having discussed this with several people, um, but uh, not so much, not so much, I would say the, the European, the Europeans. Uh, of course, uh, when it came to donors, uh, Colombian government has been looking for donors, not only the US, not only Europe, but also other possible donors. Um, but uh, I would say the important player there is the US. Uh, uh, because one could argue that if Venezuelans do not obtain a residence permit in certain countries, 
you know, a particular option could be to start moving uh, up, uh, up, uh, upwards towards towards the north. Um, so, so yeah, I think actually I think the European Union in general has been quite silent uh, about the whole issue of Venezuelans, and actually in Spain, which is the only country that's receiving Venezuelans, I think due to the particular political situation in Spain, um, it is absolutely impossible for any government not to grant at least humanitarian protection to Venezuelans. So what the Spanish government is doing is they don't give Venezuelans by and large refugee status unless, of course, you know, they fall uh, under the definition in the Geneva Convention. But all Venezuelans obtain a residence permit under humanitarian grounds. Uh, no Venezuelan is sent back to Venezuela. Uh, that will be a massive political scandal in Spain due to the political discussion or internal politics in Spain. Uh, the, the third question was about uh, uh, xenophobia. And certainly, uh, some of the most uh, terrible uh, declarations that I have heard in my life have come from Latin American politicians uh, talking about Venezuelans. Um, for example, in um, 2019, uh, Venezuelan migrant uh, killed uh, an Ecuadorian um, in Ecuador, um, in a very famous incident where the police was present but didn't intervene, and uh, and the prime minister immediately, or the president uh, Lenin Moreno immediately, or the former president immediately went out to make uh, a declaration that I will say not even Donald Trump will have made. I mean, we're talking about that level of um, disgust, uh, I will say. But but in general, of course, you know, and there have been there are other examples. The mayor of Bogota. Um, Piñera in Chile, there are different examples, but at the same time, those examples, uh, I could tell you many other examples of, of the opposite uh, sign. Uh, of course, xenophobia has increased uh, due to the arrival of, of, of Venezuelans, but uh, I would say that still the, the measures that have been taken uh, to give a uh, residence status have been moving clearly in one direction, except for, uh, in some cases, the introduction of visa requirements for Venezuelans in Peru, in Ecuador, in Chile, in Panama, in Dominican Republic, which in many cases have led to the increase in the number of Venezuelans who are in an irregular situation in the country because they were forced to cross irregularly uh, through the border. And you also asked about whether that has affected free movement as such. Um, to be honest, I would say no, but in the last two years, you have to consider also that free movement um, has been very much came to a halt due to, to COVID. Many countries actually completely clo close their borders and in some cases continue to be closed, like for example, in Argentina. Um, so, uh, but I haven't seen uh, any, any, any effects on free movement. And in fact, the opposite could be said because just in May this year, we have finally the adoption of the Andean Institute on Human Mobility, uh, which only applies to those who are part of the Andean community, which are Peru, uh, Colombia, Ecuador, and Bolivia, which is actually extremely interesting in the sense that it goes well beyond what the EU offers, in the sense that permanent residents in any of those four countries also have free movement rights. I remember this was a debate in the 1990s in, in Europe, whether long-term residents in the EU should be able to access EU citizenship. Uh, that was out of question, but that was a debate in the 1990s. And uh, you possibly remember papers by people like Dora Kostakopoulou, et cetera, right? But that has happened now in the Andean Institute on Human Mobility, adopted in May this year. Uh, under the Andean community. Uh, so a very interesting instrument. Let's see how it is implemented, but extremely interesting instrument in that regard. Um, the issue of passports, that was the, the second question. Yes, many countries, what they have been doing is precisely acknowledging uh, the difficulties in, I mean, for those of you who don't know, uh, obtaining a passport in Venezuela is a matter of uh, having the right amount of money, bribing the right people. I mean, in many cases, it can be a tremendous ordeal and it can take several months. So what many countries in the region have been doing is to accept expire passports, usually two years. Uh, they can be expired up to two years. And that has happened in Ecuador, in uh, Argentina, out of the top of my head that I can think of, but it has, I, I'm sure, happened in other countries as well. So if you're a Venezuelan national, you can also prove your nationality with an expire uh, passport. Um, and then, yes, of course, the criticism of uh, Colombia is extensive to the other countries in the region that have um, enshrined in their domestic laws 
the Cartagena definition of who is a refugee. Uh, and indeed, there are uh, some contradictions. I'm right now doing something for um, the Argentinians, uh, the Argentinian government, and it's uh, very shocking to see how they apply the Cartagena definition um, to certain refugees coming from different countries, you know, variety of countries, Ukrainians, for example, right? They can fall under the Cartagena, uh, Ukrainians coming from certain parts of Ukraine, of course, right? Can fall under the Cartagena, and they actually obtain refugee status in Argentina, but by no means they are willing, it's under, you know, no possibility whatsoever to grant refugee status to Venezuela. And that has to do with certain fears in many countries that if they were the first, to do that, uh, they will have received more uh, numbers. I think those fears are unfounded because Venezuelans have been moving to where they were more or less going to be moving. Uh, and of course, you know, if you compare the numbers in Brazil to the numbers in Colombia, of course, in Colombia is five or six times more because of the historical links, the language, the social links uh, the, the, between uh, the networks uh, between both countries, etc. Right? Um, and nonetheless, Brazil decided to grant uh, refugee status to uh, 50,000 Venezuelans. That, ha that hasn't led to any increase. Uh, or any um, increase, let's say, throughout the throughout time in the number of Venezuelans arriving to Brazil, right? Um, so yes, certainly Colombia uh, can be criticized for that, but I would say that yet uh, the pragmatism they have shown in not doing like Ecuador, Chile, and Peru, for example, in introducing a visa requirement, uh, realizing that 2,000 kilometers of border are basically impossible to control, um, and not creating further um, you know, further uh, problems for those who, who managed to cross. And um, I, I think, you know, of course, I, I totally agree with you. I, I, the, the best option will have been to give refugee status. And I will go even further. The best option will be that after a year, they obtain Colombian citizenship. Uh, and actually, I wrote an article, an opinion column in that regard in 2018. And a couple of weeks afterwards, the former mayor of Bogota actually came up with the same idea. Uh, Peñalosa saying what we should do with Venezuelans is to give them citizenship. Um, but, you know, those ideas have been uh, perhaps uh, not palatable enough for the previous administration, for this administration. So I think this is quite a pragmatic approach that is still is unique in comparative perspective. But of course, the criticism is, is absolutely correct.